Welcome to another Cornerstone Conversation, a presentation of the American Cornerstone Institute. I'm Eric Blankenstein, the Director of Policy at the American Cornerstone Institute. And today we are joined by Rob Astorino, the former Westchester County Executive, and Dr. Ben Carson, former HUD Secretary and world-renowned neurosurgeon to talk about uh, the importance of local control over housing policy and housing issues. Uh, Dr. Carson, would you like to uh, kick us off by talking a little bit about uh, that topic generally? Obviously, it's a very important topic, and it, it ties into the whole concept of America. America was a place that, that people came to because they wanted the ability to lead the life that they wanted to lead uh, in the way that they wanted to lead it without the heavy hand of government involved in everything that they do. And, uh, you know, it brings us to the topic, the affirmatively furthering fair housing uh, rule. Uh, which basically was already uh, in place when we came to HUD, but uh, had been uh, tailored in such a way that it required the various municipalities to basically uh, conform to the way that the central government wanted them to conform rather than the way that they wanted to do things. To answer these extensive questionnaires, uh, and you basically had to uh, check a, a thousand boxes of things that you were doing or were not doing. It, it resulted in creation of a, of a big board uh, with different colors on it. And then if you could move some of the pink dots to where the black dots were, and some of the black dots where the brown dots were, somehow you were gonna solve that problem. Obviously it didn't solve the problem at all. And we had uh, countless uh, cities and municipalities calling us saying, this is untenable. We can't do this. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough time. We're not gonna get our federal grants because we're not gonna meet all of your requirements. That's gonna hurt a lot of people. Uh, so, you know, we decided that maybe there was a better way to do it and to, to define uh, affirmatively furthering fair housing as, just doing something that substantially improves the ability of people to live in uh, decent, uh, fair, affordable housing. And uh, to be able to lay out a program about how they were going to do that. Uh, eventually we just scrapped the whole thing and just said, you know, we will certainly be with you. We will certainly try to help you. Um, do recognize that there's already been a very substantial uh, integration of uh, suburbia. This became an argument on behalf of many people about suburbia remaining white. Well, if you deep dive into the situation, you see that 32% uh, of suburbia are people of color. And uh, there's been a substantial migration, particularly of African-Americans and Hispanics out of the inner city. Uh, so that's already been accomplished uh, through natural means. So uh, is it really necessary to impose, uh, you know, government mandates about how many people of, uh, of a particular ethnic group need to live in a particular place or what kind of housing needs to be there? Uh, that becomes a very substantial issue and uh, challenges the whole concept of freedom. So just to give our viewers a little summary, uh, you mentioned the Obama era of affirmatively furthering fair housing rule and, uh, or as AFFH for shorthand, as we call it. And that basically the Obama administration took a line in a, in a statute that required recipients of certain grant funding to quote, certify that they are affirmatively furthering fair housing. This is a, a requirement that no one had ever noticed before, no one had ever put any definitions or conditions around, and the Obama administration latched onto that to redefine what fair housing means rather than just being free of discrimination and, uh, and, and generally fair as had been previously considered. It defined fair housing as access to transportation jobs and schools, as opposed to just being free from discrimination required localities, and Mr. Astorino, you can get into this a little bit, uh, to consider their region as a whole, as opposed to the actual locality and the people that they 
uh, govern and serve. And um, failure to do this would put substantial amounts of funding into jeopardy. And this had the practical effect of forcing suburban areas to overrule uh, zoning regulations and allow for uh, more high density, low income development. And uh, Mr. Ascarino, if you wouldn't mind walking through our viewers a little bit, the interactions you had with the Obama administration, both before and Bringing back age. bad memories, but okay. <laughs> yeah, giving you uh, giving you some PTSD <laughs> flashbacks, but uh, just <laughs> how this how this worked on the ground, both both around AFFH and generally when uh, when uh, bureaucrats in Washington felt empowered to dictate to a locality how it should set up its housing rules. Yeah, it would be nice, I think, to be a bureaucrat in D.C. Um, sit in some big concrete building and uh, have your head in the clouds because it really doesn't work that way on the ground. And that's what I had to deal with for eight years as county executive. And just to go back on how it started, uh, in 2006, the Anti-Discrimination Center out of New York, which is one guy, figured out that under the False Claims Act of 1863, he could kind of swoop into a community and force them to show whether they quote complied with the HUD regulations when they took community development block grant money. So we went into Westchester and it was a democratic county executive at the time. The Bush administration wanted nothing to do with it. And so when Obama became the president, the democratic county executive said, oh, this is great. He'll let us off, you know. And then all of a sudden he found out, nope, they wanted to make Westchester the test case, and in their words, the quote, grand experiment. And so they forced a settlement uh, in federal court, which quite frankly, I think was the wrong decision. Uh, nobody claimed that there was any falsification uh, or, or wrongdoing other than Westchester uh, didn't misappropriate money or anything, but they failed to take into consideration whether race was an impediment to housing. Okay, so the settlement was that Westchester had to build 750 units of fair and affordable housing in 31 defined white communities by the 2000 census numbers. We had uh, a certain amount of time to do it. And if we didn't meet certain benchmarks after the second year, we would get significantly fined. That was my gift. The first day I walked into office, that settlement took effect. Um, it was never easy. Local zoning is not controlled by the county. It's controlled by the local communities, by the towns. So we had no control and yet we had to finish this. So it was never set up the right way. They didn't understand how New York laws apply or county zoning uh, rules apply. Well, we did everything in good faith, but we got a letter about a year into it from the housing monitor who was basically at will by HUD, could be fired by them. So it was never set up as a fair game. And they basically said, we understand what's in the agreement, but you're gonna go outside the four corners of the agreement and do X, Y, and Z. And basically, as you'd mentioned, regionalize planning and zoning, give the federal government some control and say, and manipulate who lives where. We immediately said, nope, that's not what we agreed to. We will build the housing. We will work with communities and developers. We will put money into this, but we're not gonna do that. And from that point on, uh, it was clear that the Obama administration, through this undefined at that time AFFH rule, we even had said to them, how do we comply with something that has no definition? And we were constantly told, we'll get to that, but you're going to do X, Y, and Z. So we kept doing our bargain. We were looking at property, uh, working with communities. You know, you, you try, I don't know where most of the country, but in New York, certainly, you try to put a, a, you know, a fence up on your property or a shed and you go through a whole rigmarole and the community comes out with pitchforks. Try to put affordable housing in neighborhoods and a whole host of reasons there's pushback. But we were able to work with communities while HUD and the monitor wanted us to sue our communities and, and just set up a, a negative beginning uh, and, and, and hope and conclusion is really what they wanted at the end. We didn't do that. We kept working with our communities. We ended up building all the housing that we were supposed to, and then some. Of course, we busted the budget. We knew that was going to happen, but we were under compliance. Um, and along the way, we kept going back to federal court with a, a very unfriendly federal judge, let's say. And, um, and it wasn't until the Trump administration and Dr. Carson got in there that they would actually see what we were saying, because we had all these zoning studies done as required 
11, I think, different, including by Pace University's uh, land use. And they all came up with the same thing. There is no exclusionary zoning. Each community, one that's as diverse as in Mount Vernon, New York, which is overwhelmingly African-American and its neighbor Bronxville, which is overwhelmingly white and affluent, they all have very similar zoning. And all of them had different types of affordable housing, but just not to the liking of the federal government. So eventually, thankfully, when, when President Trump, Dr. Carson got in, they saw this for what it was, an attack on the suburbs, a completely unfair and heavy handed use of the federal government with the Justice Department threatening communities under this whole thing called disparate impact, which we can get into. It's guilt by association, guilt by statistics, and it flips the burden of proof. You are guilty until you can prove yourself innocent, uh, other than obviously the, the correct way in America. So, but it was they who fixed the AFH, AFFH rule and put the decision-making rightfully so back into the communities and less of a heavy-handed approach by the federal government and more of a supportive role by the federal government. You know, as head secretary, I had an opportunity to travel across the country, visit multitudinous communities. And uh, the ones that were allowed to solve these problems on their own were able to include affordable housing, uh, but they did it in appropriate ways. Uh, you can go to some of the uh, very exclusive uh, African-American communities in this country. I guarantee you, they don't want you to put in the middle of their community a, a big public structure uh, for housing, mm -hmm. uh, but they're quite willing to have it placed in the community at an appropriate location. Um, you know, I have certainly am not a racist, but you know I live in a community uh, of, of very expensive houses uh, with a lot of you know people here who groom the lawns and do all these kinds of things. If somebody, some government official, came in and said, "Okay, over there, three houses down, we're going to build this big uh, complex." Um, I think everybody in the community would have something to say about that. I don't think that necessarily has to do with one's race. And so, you know, we have to be logical. We have to use common sense when we're thinking about these things. Uh, the communities that I visited felt exactly the same way, but it didn't mean that they weren't willing to set aside some properties and build beautiful uh, housing there. And that frequently inspired more growth around that particular area that was very uh, nice growth that people enjoyed and wanted to be around. So there are ways to do it and the communities are doing it. They're allowed to do it. His two predecessors, uh, Secretary Castro and Secretary Donovan were, were adamant in having federal control. And uh, Dr. Carson mentioned about you know, communities and you live in single family homes and all of a sudden the federal government is gonna say three houses down, you know, build uh, an apartment building. That is completely true because what they were attacking was zoning. And what they said was even single family quarter acre lots, which in my definition and most people is sort of like the American dream, right? You, you, you scratch and save and pay a bank for 30 years to, to own a quarter acre, if that sometimes, and, and have that as your home. And so there's nothing racist or segregated or discriminatory about that. There are rules and laws on the books by real estate agents and others that you can't discriminate based up upon the color of their skin and things like that. We're all supportive of that. That's not what we're talking about. Under H HUD's old delusional view, Basically, they said, again, single family residential is discriminatory. How patronizing is that, by the way, when they're saying that, in essence, minorities are incapable of owning their own home unless the federal government gets involved? To me, that is so patronizing and demeaning and untrue because we've seen home ownership explode with people of all races and colors and backgrounds choosing to live where they want. But under HUD's view, things like zoning and height and density and acreage and even water and sewer availability, 
all of those were quote impediments and potentially exclusionary. And so when you take away zoning, as Dr. Carson mentioned, there's a reason why communities set up their communities. This is an area where we're only gonna have single family homes on this size lot. Maybe the next area would be a bigger size lot for people who can afford it. Uh, but we're not gonna have the bomb factory in the middle of, of houses. We're gonna put them on the other side. That's what zoning is. It doesn't exclude, it says what can and can't be built, not who can live there. But in, in HUD's view in the past, it was uh, this is who has to live there. And if you take away the zoning, for the government or, or HUD or developers, you take it away for everybody. So yes, in a single family residential neighborhood, if you have a house here and a house there and a house next door, the next lot that could be sold to the government or a developer could squeeze six units of a townhouse or 30 stories high, and there wouldn't be any protections under what the HUD warped view was in the past. Yeah, and, and the HUD view isn't yeah. just that uh, they need to allow all kinds of building, but they don't necessarily like that the communities themselves or localities themselves look a certain way. Uh, the story of Dubuque, Iowa is relatively famous in that HUD was encouraging, if not forcing Dubuque to spend its uh, public sector housing on advertising to people in Chicago because the demographics of, Dub of Dubuque were not, uh, were not similar. Uh, you want to tell your story that's similar to that? Well, we had to do that too as part of the agreement, which again, I was so opposed to the settlement because of how it was written. It was so open-ended, gave all the authority to the federal monitor and HUD and, and really just handcuffed us in what we could do. And we had to advertise with our tax dollars um, to places like Newark, to places like Bridgeport, simply because HUD wanted to go fishing in a certain area. And it was just, again, so patronizing, but also we have people in Westchester, black, white, Hispanic, everybody who would like affordable housing in our own communities built by our tax dollars. And so, yeah, I still remember the first time I walked into Dr. Carson's old building, it was 20, I think it was 2010 and um, Secretary Donovan I go into his office with some of his staff and he takes out this big map of Westchester County. And he basically says, pointing his finger, why aren't you building over there in the Northeast portion of Westchester? I said, you mean where it's all green and, and blue, where, where it's all watershed protected and New York City drinking water? And you might wanna ask the state and the cities, DEP, Depart Department of Environmental Protection or Conservation and the EPA why we can't build there because we can't. And by the way, there's no sewer systems up there. There's no you know, utilities, there's no bus routes. Their response, so build it. <laughs> <laughs> what we're Everything doing. is simple to those who know nothing about it. Yes, exactly. As you mentioned, as Dr. Carson mentioned, uh, in the Trump administration, the affirmatively furthering fair housing rule was repealed. Dr. Carson, do you want to talk a little bit about that process and, and what was put in place in its stead? First thing we did is it's get rid of the assessment tool. Uh, because, uh, you know, that required a full-time employee. And, many, and in some of the larger municipalities, more than one full-time employee. Uh, salaries, of course, uh, associated with that, and an enormous amount of time. Uh, and, of course, we were branded as being horrible people for doing that. And then we withdrew the, uh, the, the, rule, alt, the, uh, the rule altogether. And of course, we were. Uh, there were multiple stories about how racist we were uh, in the process of doing that. No evidence of it whatsoever uh, that we were backing away from all the civil rights uh, victories that had been gained over the last few decades. Uh, if they, of course, would look at the real data, uh, they would see that uh, our uh, legal department actually cleared up more than 22,000 backlog uh, uh, housing discrimination cases uh, that had been left over from the previous administration and very aggressively pursued uh, anything that came up as a discriminatory complaint. Uh, they stopped talking about it because you know they couldn't make that point anymore because they looked at the data. Of course, they wouldn't ever admit it publicly or talk about it. But, uh, you know, we had a, a stellar record of, of getting rid of discriminatory actions. 
And the, the more important point to make, of course, is that America being a place of liberty works much better when we allow people to be free. Uh, and understanding that we still obviously have some bad actors, so we should monitor what's going on. And if there is a problem, we should correct it. Uh, for instance, in, in Los Angeles, uh, for many, many years, they had reneged on the responsibility for providing access to people who were handicapped. And, uh, you know, this had gone on for a couple of administrations before the Trump administration got there. And there were always promises, but nothing was done. Uh, so we basically came in and, uh, you know, insisted that they do it and they still dragged their feet. So we simply told them that there would be no more federal funding and they fixed it. Um, you know, that's why you need to monitor these things and you need to deal with them as they exist. But trying to preemptively control everything, uh, that's not freedom. Yeah, and, and you talked about the assessment tool and I, I think it's worse than you even let on uh, because we, when we were looking at the rule, we heard from municipalities and counties and all over the place that it was so complicated and so difficult to complete and required so much data that they had to go out and hire outside consultants to complete their certification process. Right. And there's a great irony exactly. in taking public funds that are designed to help uh, low-income people or designed to uh, better the community and funnel it off to consultants who are helping comply with bureaucratic paperwork. I think uh, that- And that, that was particularly difficult for the small ones. So yeah. the small ones who didn't have all of that money to be hiring consultants. Exactly. Uh, the, the bigger ones could just shift money. Yeah. Yeah. Including it's, uh, some of the independent housing agencies who had to deal with all that. But at Westchester County, I mean, we had literally probably two dozen people in their planning department um, and uh, engineering and everybody just dealing with all of this basically on a daily basis, which took away from doing everything else they're supposed to do in the county. Um, and, you know, the amount of man hours and money was spent. Eventually, we, we submitted to HUD. It was several feet high, the compliance issues that they continuously rejected, by the way. And the assessment tool was nothing more than a coercion tool, because literally there was one point, I remember some folks from the planning department and our, um, the, the guy who was overseeing everything for us on our floor, he went down to the city, to the HUD regional office, and um, they were trying to comply with an order by the court that we get together and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, he said, literally, they had HUD people standing behind them over their shoulder saying, write this, type that, do that. So it wasn't an assessment tool. It really was a coercion tool. And at some point, we just said, no, we don't agree with that, and we're not going to do it. But that, that, was the, that was the mindset. And I'm worried that the new administration uh, is completely doubling down on the AFFH rule. Uh, you know, President Biden supported it in the campaign. He's supporting it now. It goes much further than simply saying you're not going to get block grant money or money from HUD, but they're also tying transportation funding to it. So they're going to make it really difficult for communities to say no. But once they'd sign that deal with the devil, uh, and hopefully they actually read the fine print and understand what they're signing into for some money that they could probably just spend on their own. And I've told communities, the best way to not get in bed with the federal government, because once you do, you're never getting out of that bed with them, and they're going to control a lot more than you think, is to just not take the money. When you don't take it, if you want to build your own playground or park, budget it. Use your own tax dollars, because once you take the federal money, they will have a say, and you will at some point have a letter from the Justice Department and HUD demanding X, Y, and Z, which of course scares the hell out of a lot of communities because they're not equipped to fight this. They don't have the money. They don't have the endless supply of lawyers and tax dollars. And so oftentimes they'll settle or reach a, you know, uh, a settlement agreement. And that's exactly uh, what we should not be doing in this country. Sad thing is that they're being driven by ideology yes. rather than by facts. Correct. If, yep. if they were driven by facts, they would go and they would look at the statistics. They would see that 
what they were trying to achieve has already been achieved and mm -hmm. beyond that. Uh, okay. So maybe redirect your attention and your funding to a real problem. Quick question about the the lawsuits and the settlement specifically. Do you feel as though your predecessor uh, advocated for the interests of Westchester and, and fought in good faith the allegations that were being made? Or was it more of a collusive settlement where they saw the writing on the wall, someone who disagreed was going to come in and wanted to kind of have this hammer to hold over them? or you uh, to, to make your policies more aligned with what they wanted to do? It was in 2009, which was the election year. So I was running against him. And I remember when he uh, basically issued a settlement, a consent decree, and it had to go to the County Board of Legislators for their approval in order for it to be binding. And he basically said that if you do not support this, anyone, if you don't support this, you are a racist. So here he was playing the race card, just like HUD taught him to do. And, um, and they reluctantly, it's interesting because they were, uh, it passed by the thinnest of margins and all six who, all five who voted against it Two were Democrats, three Republicans, but all were lawyers. And they all said the way this is written, it will be horrendous for Westchester County as we go forward. It's almost impossible to comply. And the power that we're gonna be giving the federal government into our affairs is gonna be endless. And um, instead of fighting it, the, law, the county spent over $6 million uh, in, in legal fees getting to that point. And um, instead of fighting it, they decided to, to lay down. And I remember we, you know, so we were one of the first ones, if not the first. And then once I was in office, I was getting calls over the years from communities and counties all over the country about what we were going through. They were facing similar circumstances. Some of course, just, you know, folded like a cheap accordion immediately. And others wanted to, to fight back and did like uh, communities in Texas. But they were then withholding hurricane relief funds. I mean, how perverse is this? They were really attacking and withholding money from the people who needed it the most simply to drive this ideological wedge and, uh, and try to achieve their regionalization goals. I remember I was on Fox one night, I think it was on Hannity, and this issue, we were talking about this issue, and I got off the air and my phone exploded with emails from all over the country, uh, as well as to the county. And it was this agenda, what was it, Agenda 51? No, Agenda 21 or something that was in the United Nations, I could remember. 21. Yeah, Agenda 21. Yeah, 21. And it, was it was basically this. It was the regionalization, you know, extending cities into the suburbs and, um, and basically attacking zoning and communities. Uh, this disparate impact issue I mentioned before, which unfortunately I thought was one of the worst decisions that the Supreme Court has made in, in a couple generations. And we were watching this, this case because it was going to have immediate impact on ours and, and going forward. And uh, it passed five to four. Um, and it basically said that disparate impact can be used by the government um, in basically all their agencies. And it really is guilt by association if a community is overwhelmingly white, therefore it is exclusionary, discriminatory, and that community, the burden of proof to prove they're not, is on the community and not on the federal government. And you see this in our banking, you see this in finance, you see this really across the board now where they're using uh, disparate impact uh, to achieve a lot of these goals. And it was a really, I thought, really bad decision by the Supreme Court. If we had a, a honest press yeah. who really did their jobs well, you know, they would be pointing out to the people very specifically that the, the problems with using something like this for impact. You know, for instance, uh, the federal government is now saying uh, minimum wage has to be $15 an hour. Well, what is the impact of that? Uh, it tends to make people who are unskilled unemployable. And uh, a disproportionate number of those people are black and brown people. Therefore, the government it would be responsible uh, under disparate impact uh, and would be guilty of violating that rule. 
I mean, and you, and, and, you know, that's just one example. You could just take it to the ends of the earth. And obviously uh, it provides a mechanism like many of the things that we've seen recently to get the government more involved rather than less involved in the day-to-day -day actions that we each take. And that's exactly the reason that people came to America so that they could get away from that. Mm -hmm. and, and we just are gonna to have to be very vigilant and constantly talking about it. That is really one of the real purposes of American Cornerstone, you know, to bring out to the people what the real facts are because we're not likely to get that media anytime soon. Uh, although I very frequently talk to young correspondents and I say, wouldn't you like to be on the leading edge of bringing journalism back to respectability? Uh, and it's possible that that could happen, but uh, I don't see it anytime soon. They probably said, no, I prefer to be an activist. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think I got into journalism? <laughs> Uh, Mr. Asperino, you, you noted that the Biden administration is reviving uh, the FFH rule and, to, to use your words, doubling down on it. What advice would you have to people who were in your position as, as county executives or chief executives of, of a locality in terms of dealing with this? Uh, is it worth it to fight? Is it, you know, are there mitigation strategies? What do you think they should be pursuing if, if they are forced to deal with the uh, this Biden administration, this HUD and this uh, DOJ action to kind of impose federal control over localities? First and foremost, you have to ask yourself, do you really need the money from the federal government with all the strings attached? Understand what those strings are because they're very wide ranging. They will take root and go deep into your community. Uh, if you want the federal government basically having a big say in control over how you develop, how you plan and zone your community, who goes where? I had, I had many black pastors, Hispanic pastors say to me, I don't want my members of my church to have to move 20 miles north. You know, all their, their friends, their services, their church, everything is here. Why can't we build more affordable housing here? And I said, exactly. I said, but that's not what the settlement says. And when they understood it, some of the fiercest opposition, believe it or not, was from members in the urban communities who were saying, wait a minute, you're taking away money from, from where we need to build affordable housing just to satisfy what the federal government says and where it should go in places like Chappaqua, home of the Clintons. And ironically, the one big battle we had over building this settlement issue and, and where was in Chappaqua. Uh, the irony of all ironies, right? And I did a press conference outside the Clinton's home. And I said, look, do you think that the community that you live in is racist and segregated like the federal government is claiming? And if not, then why aren't you speaking out? And if so, why the hell are you living in a community like that? Of course, they, um, they never decided to come out the house. The Secret Service said, Mrs. Clinton, um, she's busy right now, but she'll get back to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, she didn't. Yeah. Um, but we'll the, circle back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But the real issue is to, to communities: Do you really need that kind of money? Do you need a hundred thousand dollars to build a playground when you can be budgeting that yourself? And if you do it yourself, you're 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 safe. You're not in bed with the federal government. Once you take that money, um, there's a lot of red flags. Really understand what Westchester went through, what other communities, and what their goal is. And don't be afraid to be called this, that, and the other thing, because quite frankly, that's the only tool that they use now. The left, everything is racist today in their eyes uh, because mm -hmm. it puts people on the defensive. You know, nobody wants to be tagged with that. I didn't like to be tagged with that, but I understood that that was gonna be the obstacle to, to actually getting things done. You take a pencil out of the budget now and you're killing kids, you're racist, you're this, that, and the other thing. But that's how the left is now in many ways taking hold of America, which is a very dangerous hold and direction that we're going in, but we have to fight back for our freedoms. And I think, thank God, American Cornerstone and you are fighting back and, and people have to get off the couch and understand what is at stake. And uh, we're seeing it now that the Trump fog is on where the last four years, it was just red hot politically and people could only love or hate Donald Trump and they couldn't see anything else. Now that the fog is dissipating there, it's sort of like miss me now because there were protections there and people have to understand what is at stake. 
Well, people should not be afraid of, of being called names. You know, Chelsea Handler said that I was a supremacist. You know, I don't pay attention to that uh, silly stuff. Uh, but you brought up one very good point, and that is uh, the way the AFFH uh, rule works, it actually transfers money from the places that really need to be habilitated uh, to the suburbs. And uh, it, it's really sort of a double whammy uh, in terms of the damage that it's doing uh, in both places. Whereas if we thought this thing out in a serious and logical manner, what we want for people is choice. And uh, that includes people who live in the inner city, that includes people who live in the suburbs, uh, people who live in rural areas. Choice, that's what America is about. And creating the mechanisms where people can exercise that choice without having the government's heavy hand decide for them. That's the bottom line. Yeah, one and, other and thing, source of income law, which was part of the settlement that the county had to, the county executive had to present a source of income law to the county board. It did not say that the county board had to adopt it. And so I did what I was supposed to, and then I lobbied against it, and I'll tell you why. And I was basically, I uh, was this far away from being held in contempt of court by the federal um, courts because the source of income law, which basically states that you can't discriminate where a renter gets their money from as they pay for the rent. That's fine. No problem with that. However, Section 8 is included in that. Section 8 is a voluntary voucher system that a landlord or that a landlord willingly accepts with all the strings attached uh, and has a basically a partnership with the federal government. You don't have to do that. You have many landlords that say, I don't want to accept Section 8 because I don't want to deal with the rules and the regulations and the heavy handedness of the federal government. I'm building affordable housing on my own. This required all landlords to have to accept Section 8. And once they take that voucher, they then are into the to the world of the federal government. That's why I said it wasn't fair. Um, David Patterson, the African-American former governor of New York, vetoed uh, just like I did, he vetoed a state Section 8 uh, source of income law, basically using the exact same language I had used the year before. Um, and so it's not discriminatory. It's about the freedom and liberty of an individual to choose or not to choose whether or not to deal with the federal government on this. Liberty and, as you mentioned earlier, community with pastors not wanting to uh, have their residents relocated. It's like a wise man said to me, liberty and community are two of the cornerstones of America. Mm -hmm. um, this has been a great conversation. Dr. Carson, do you have any uh, closing thoughts? Uh, I just want to uh, thank Rob Vasparino for, for being a trooper and, <laughs> uh, and the many other people who recognize that we are going to have to stand up. When I say we, I'm talking about the logical people, uh, the people who love America and who want to preserve America and its principles for the next generation. We have to stand up. We can't be afraid because if we're afraid and we stay quiet, our values uh, and our freedoms will shrink away. You cannot be the land of the free if you're not the home of the brave. That's well, I wear these battle scars with pride of dealing with HUD for and the federal government for eight years. It was worth the fight. It was worth... Um, putting a spotlight on what was happening in America. I will continue to do so. And Dr. Carson, thank you for your courage and leadership. Uh, when you became secretary of HUD, you, you knew exactly what we were dealing with, but also the big picture. And, um, you know, as I, as I said, we didn't uh, elect President Trump and, and Ben Carson as secretary of HUD to, to kick a field goal. We wanted to score a touchdown because that was going to be the most meaningful. And you did it. So thank you very much. This has been a Cornerstone Conversation. Thank you for joining us.